Hello and welcome back everybody. So this is the last video in the series and I will show here how can you use the random walk metropolis algorithm from two videos ago to get an estimate of the growth rates of the virus pandemic or decay rates. And once we have done that, finally I want to conclude by discussing a bit the next steps which one could do if one wanted to work further on that problem. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So in the previous video, our final result for this picture, and that band was our estimate for the smooth daily rate of virus death. And what I want to do in this video is I want to show the growth or decay in death. So what we need is really the derivative of this curve, and you will see estimating derivatives from data is somewhat harder than estimating the curve itself from data. And we are trying to do that with uncertainties in the picture. So we need to be a bit careful and we shouldn't expect too much of the results. Okay, that being said, I want to do relative growth rates. So I want to say growth by a percent a day or decays by a percent a day. So we first need to work out how do we get relative growth rates from this curve. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. I want to determine relative growth rates for this function lambda. As I recall, we had defined lambda to be segments of exponential functions. So the first segment, say, was a0 e to the lambda 0 t. That was for all t in the first time interval, t0 to t1. Then new constants a1 e to the lambda 1 t for all t in t1, t2, and so on. And the segments were made so that where they meet, they connect in a continuous way. Good. So how do we get growth rates? So the absolute growth, if we say go over the time interval from t to t plus epsilon, equals, well, we just subtract the two values. So we get a i e to the lambda i t plus epsilon, that's after, and a i e to the lambda i t, that's at the start. and that is the growth in just number of death. Okay, so I want rates, so absolute growth rate. That would be the same thing, but then divided by the length of the time interval, which is epsilon. And you can see this, this looks like a derivative. So if I take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, what I will get is I will get the derivative of that function is required to be a minus. So that's the increment over small time interval divided by length of time interval. And if the length of the time interval goes to zero, I get the derivative ai stays. The exponential has itself as the derivative. And then I need to do the inner derivative lambda i t has derivative lambda i. So that's the absolute growth rate at time t. And then I want to do the relative growth rate. And I get this by dividing the growth rate by the current value, though so that is a i e to the lambda i t times lambda i divided, the current value is a i e to the lambda i t, so I get lambda i. So that's easy enough. So these exponents lambda here, that's what we are after. That's the relative growth rates. And to get these, we just need to remember how we fitted this model. So the curves themselves, they looked maybe like that. So we have these exponential segments joined together. But for fitting the model and in which involved finding the lambda i, what I did is I used the fact that if I take logarithms, then these exponential segments turn into straight lines. So if I do a plot of log lambda of t here, then the same picture would be straight line increase, straight line decrease. And these line segments, that is log a i e to the lambda i and what we get is log a i plus log of exponential just cancels and I just get lambda i t. So what we see is this lambda i here that is just the slope in a linear function constant plus lambda i t. So for each segment we where the slope is vertical distance divided by horizontal distance. Okay so let's do what we just said. So first thing we need to do is we need to unpack our vector theta. So let me just write a function. I want to call this rate. And that has argument theta, which describe where the exponential segments join. And 
similar to lambda, what we need to do is we need to get out of theta zti and log ai. So I copy that here. And then what we said is on a log plot, so we have logarithmic phi values, that is good. We take the slopes of each line. So what I do is div log ai, that is the increments on the vertical axis, divided by div ti, that's the increments on the horizontal axis. And if I divide these, then I get a vector, which for each interval tells me what's the slope in this interval. And now I want to evaluate that as a collection of points so that I can plot curves and so on. So let's say S is where we evaluate this. And the only problem is now we need to figure out for each element of S, that's going to be a vector, which interval it is in, so that we know which of these values are we going to use. And what we can do is we can use this approx function again. We used it before when we defined the curve lambda, namely return a list of points which linearly interpolate given data. And here it mentions constant interpolation and constant interpolation just means piecewise constant. That's what we need here. So we just need to get this call to approx right. So what we need is we need to say method is constant and so we need to somehow solve the question, are the values attached to the left or to the right of the grid point? And F determines whether it's attached to the left or right end point. So it says if we are between Y0 and Y1, Y0 left, Y1 right, then we get Y0 times 1 minus F plus Y1 times F. So if I said F equals 0, I always get the left end point. So let's try that. So that's what I came up with. I take the times with the last time point removed because the diff makes everything one shorter. We have one fewer intervals than we have points. And then since I removed the last point, I need to attach every interval to the point on the left. That was correspond to f equals zero, but up here we see that is actually the default value. So we don't need to do anything. I said method is constant and now we are missing the rightmost point. So there we want to attach the value from the last interval and that's why I did rule equal to. And we discovered earlier that returns a list which has x and y values and we only need the y values because the x values which we plug in here, well, we have them ourselves, so we don't need them returned. So that should do the right thing. And now we can just return that. So return R. Let's just try to do a quick example. So I do theta is a random theta just for testing. And let's do S, a list which goes from T min to T max. That was a whole time interval we are considering. And I don't know, 200 steps. I think that's what we used before. And I want to do two plots, one of lambda and one of rate. Rate we know must show whether lambda increases or decreases. So I say we want two plots on top of each other. So we do plot S against lambda, S and theta. So let's start this over. Type is L. That's a random lambda. And now underneath I will plot the rate. And that is hard to say whether it worked because there are these stretches where lambda is so close to zero. So here we may have grown or shrunk, but because it's relative growth, we can't really see that. But here we see there is a region of fast increase and we see that corresponds to a high rate. Then we have slower increase that could be here and here. Then we have fast decay that corresponds to these low values. Then we increase and decay again. So I think it could have worked. In particular, it did not crash. So let's assume that that is right. Then I'm going to copy the last random walk metropolis function. And I'll call the new copy number three. And that is the same as before, but instead of lambda, we want now to do the rate. So we can just run again this code, but this time with rate instead of lambda. So that's the only change we need to make. 
And what we will get back as before is the average of lambda and we will get standard deviations we can use to plot bands. And as before, we use this random walk metropolis algorithm, which is built into here to generate the samples, but we didn't change anything there. So we don't need to redo the tuning. We can just use the algorithm as it is. So let's do a quick test run with a short time series with short Markov chain. And then once we have this, we do the proper run, which will take a bit of time. So let's say M is run random walk metropolis three. That's what I called it. And I need to say the number of steps and let's just do a hundred thousand here for now. We will later probably use a million or maybe even more. Good, so there's a result. And let me just copy the old code we had to plot a line. I think we need to change only the label and nothing else. So relative growth rate. And you see what I did here, I multiplied the values all with 100 to turn them into percent. So that is now percent per day. So I could do that and I probably need to also switch off the two rows and set it one row, one column. Okay, so let's try that. Ah, here I have something already in place, which I only want to do later. So let's not have this now. And then we get the band. So that looks not absurd. We had very high growth rates at the start. Then there was some lockdown, it goes down, then it's down over summer, goes up again, and then a second lockdown and goes down again. So I think that could have worked. So let me run that properly. So maybe a million again. Actually, I suggest what I do is I will go and have lunch now and I will run that for 10 million steps, which I think should just take 20 minutes or so. And after my lunch is finished, we should have a good run. So let's run that and I'll see you after my lunch and when that run has finished. Okay, so here we go. That is the curve we ended up with. So that still has a similar structure. Let me just compare that to the previous picture. That was the picture before. That was the picture after. And as we have seen it in the last application, the width of these bands has increased by running it longer, which probably means we may need to run it even longer because we may still need time to explore the state space. Running it longer seems to maybe change the distribution. So the overall structure seems to stay very similar. The estimate of the rate at the beginning and the end is similar. At the beginning, it's virtually unchanged, only with larger uncertainties. At the end, it's hard to say because the y-axis scale changes. It may be the same at the end too. And in between, it is down over the summer, goes up again, and then goes down again. So. What I would like to do is I would like to try to line that up with real world events. Let's learn how we can add vertical lines to this plot where we can mark, for example, the start of the lockdown and that kind of things. So I've made the function here where we can plug in the day as a string, year, month, day, and that is converted to a date object here, then that plots a vertical line that V stands for vertical at the time we have given it. And then to go with the line, it plots text in blue and it's rotated 90 degrees so that it lines up with the line. Let me show you how that works. So we need to give it a day and a label to be plotted there. So that, for example, would end the 23rd of March plot a line and label it start of first lockdown. I try to look that up. I believe that's the correct date for it. And you see there is first the start of the lockdown or the label we need to adjust a bit. And then there's a gap, hard to say how much this is. And only afterwards values are starting to go down. This is because death we are looking at here are time delayed. So the lockdown will affect infections and this gap here may reflect the time it takes from somebody catching the illness to then 
maybe dying of illness a while later. So that could explain this gap. That just puts the second lockdown in similarly. So the second lockdown starts on the 5th of November. And again, there is a bit of time delay. So that makes sense. And actually that gives me some confidence in that what we are seeing here is possibly reasonable. I put a few more in. I have here the early May bank holiday, which was this year VE day, the late May bank holiday. Then when the rules changed that six people could meet outside and that pubs and restaurants could reopen. So that was part of the winding down of the first lockdown. Then at the end of summer, schools started reopening, universities started again. Then came the three-tier system in Liverpool and Manchester and well, we had this. So let's add all of these. Now with the shift, it's a bit hard to say whether anything lines up. So let me just make a larger version of this plot. What do we see here? So on top of the shift, there are these funny spikes, like at the end of the decrease from the first lockdown. And I think these actually indicate a problem with our Markov chain still. I think the spike is just where the connection point between the two segments moved left and right and then sometimes we got the slope from the upwards pointing segment and sometimes we got the slope from the downward pointing segment and that leads to a large variance but this tells us that some of these connection points the ti moved only very little and maybe should have moved more so one thing to look into would be, can we make it so that the Markov chain explores more of the space of what the connection points could be connected? Good. And else there is this shift. So I think I will first shift the data like two weeks to the left so that it lines up with the lockdowns better. So I ended up shifting the data by 11 days rather than two weeks so that the alignment for the first lockdown is perfect. The price is now the second lockdown does not line up perfectly. I don't know why that is. Maybe something in the middle would have been better. But this way we see at least some reflection of the events on the data. So after the late May bank holiday, that was maybe the quietest period of the summer. And definitely that's the segment with the lowest values of the curve. And then when relaxation of the conditions start, that's was at the beginning of June, here marked as six people can meet outside, the value goes up and where it says pubs and restaurants can reopen, it gradually goes up some more. Then I'm not sure what happened at the end of summer. Then on that plot, schools reopening and universities reopening has no effect or if so, maybe even a negative one. Not sure about this. And then the three tier system may actually have worked because around that time, the curve goes down a bit and again here we are not perfectly lined up and one thing to explore would be why that is the case and whether my shift is maybe wrong but still it goes down at least around the time of the second lockdown so i think that's all what we can say here about this curve but that picture i think is a nice result of our analysis so i want to conclude by discussing shortcomings of the analysis and how one could make further progress on that. So let me just write further work. So the first thing is, I believe there may still be problems with our Markov chain being fast enough to explore the state space. So it's called mixing technically of the Markov chain. And that is affected by how do we choose the proposals for the random walk metropolis algorithm. So the sigmas, which I spent some time tuning, but there are also just different ways to generate proposals. And one of them would be to move only one connection point of these exponential segments at a time. So currently every proposal moved all connection points. And that was kind of enforced because I said the proposal distribution must have a density, so it must cover the full space. But one can extend the theory to say one stays on some subset subspace and that would allow one to just change a point at a time. So such an algorithm would go, would pick one of these junctions at random, one of the points where two exponential segments connect and just change this without changing all the others. And that trick 
would probably allow to get higher acceptance rates or then to use larger sigmas and to move through space a bit faster. So change one TIAI at a time instead of all at once would be one way one could probably improve things, but we didn't cover this in this video. So if you want to learn about this, that is described in section 4.1.5 of the book. And one could also think of maybe all in one go removing one of these points between two segments and merging them and instead splitting another segment. Or one could try to introduce some things with some mechanisms which make it easier to have large scale large scale movement of the TI. So my guess is the AI were fine, but maybe the TI didn't move enough, which may have led to these funny kinks in the plot. Then another thing one could do is I just fixed the number of segments to, I believe, 12 or 15, I forgot. But this number, whatever it was, was entirely made up by me. And instead one could try to have the algorithm choose this number. So one could try to use variable k. So k was the number of segments. And that can be done. And the resulting method is called reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo method. And that's a bit more complicated and I'm not going to cover this in these videos, but you can read about this in the book too. And that is section 4.5. So if one were to do that for real, one would probably make both of these changes. And then, of course, speaking of doing this for real, what one really should do is to talk to an expert about epidemics, because I just chose the prior distribution of what these curves look like, basically uniform to make things simple. But if you know about the things, there may be much better choices and you can put a bit of knowledge of the expert into your model by choosing a prior distribution cleverly. So that is one thing you can get out of this. And you should probably check with somebody who knows about the things whether your analysis makes sense at all. But also this question of how long deaths occur after infections, for example, which I used to shift my plot in the end, that must be known, I would assume. So this shift, one should really not attempt to estimate from data, but I assume if you ask the right people, you will just learn how much this is. There are many more things one could do, but to me, these are the most obvious next steps. So if you are interested in this example, you can play with the data yourself. I showed in the second video how to download this, and you can read a bit more in the book and learn how to make the method a bit more clever. And there is much scope for improvement. But for us, this is the end here. And I hope from following these videos, you have learned something about how Markov chain Monte Carlo methods can be used in practice. So thank you all.